The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is John Davis and I'm supervisor of MarineDebris.info, the discussion forum on marine litter and ocean plastics. On this webinar, we also have Nick Wainer, project manager of MarineDebris.info and OpenChannels.org, who is handling the webinar's technical side and co-moderating with me. And we are co-hosting this webinar with the EBM Tools Network, the Alliance of Users of Coastal and Ocean Management Tools. So happy you can all be here today. It's gonna to be a great uh, presentation. We have Daniela Russo, CEO and founder of Think Beyond Plastic, and Ann Warner, Innovation Program Manager at Think Beyond Plastic. They'll be speaking about accelerating the solutions to ocean plastic, trends and lessons from five years of the Marine Plastics Innovation Challenge. The way this will work is that Daniela and Ann will speak for about 30 minutes, then we'll have the rest of the time for questions. We definitely encourage questions or comments, and you can submit them at any point during the webinar in the question panel on the webinar user interface on your screen in the section that says questions. Also, if you have any technical difficulties, you can note them as well in the questions panel, and we'll do our best to help you. When we get to the question and answer portion, I will moderate the questions, taking one at a time and asking the questions to Daniela and Anne. So let's get started. Um, Daniela, I think you're up first. I'll turn it over to you now. Yes, I am, and thank you very much uh, for inviting us to uh, speak to this uh, excellent audience about a topic that we all care about. Uh, Anne and I are very excited to share this next hour with you and uh, to make ourselves available to all of your questions. And uh, just to be sure, uh, together we're going to speak for 30 minutes, so not each of us 30 minutes. So this will give us plenty of time to uh, interact and we look forward to it. Um, Think Beyond Plastic is an innovation accelerator with focus specifically on the global plastic pollution problem. And our work is focused uh, precisely on plastic pollution because it is one of the major global challenges that the planet faces today. We don't need to tell you that. Uh, you are all familiar with the magnitude, the size and the economic impacts of this problem. We like to look at it as an untapped innovation and entrepreneurial opportunity. So our focus is on inspiring innovation, large mass global scale innovation with focus on solutions to plastic pollution. And that includes materials, uh, manufacturing, uh, packaging design, and um, in accelerating businesses uh, with commercial potentials focused on in this area and developing the entire innovation ecosystem for what we refer to as the new plastics economy. So, as we said, uh, plastic pollution is a problem that tends to be well understood, uh, but uh, for, the for the most part looked at as uh, trash and uh, an environmental issue that uh, can be dealt with with end of pipeline innovation. Uh, if we recycle more, we'll get ourselves out of this mess. We don't believe that's the case. We believe that uh, recycling is an important component, but today it uh, takes only a very small percentage of the material that's manufactured and put out there. But the reality is plastic is a valuable material that uh, has a lot of um, environmental benefits. It uh, reduces transportation costs. It uh, presents great commercial uh, uh, benefits to packaging uh, and big brands that use it for food presentation, for uh, safety, and uh, for, um, you know, it has marketing advantages. So as we look into this problem, we are faced with the several conflicting challenges that we need to uh, handle. And um, they have to do with um, major trends that are taking place right now in, 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 in the mar global market. And I think these trends are going to affect our interaction with plastics for the years to come. So it's important that we focus on them. One, that hockey stick chart uh, that we're pretty sure all of you on the phone have already seen in one variety or another, demonstrates the incredible exponential use of plastics from the 60s to, um, to, to today. And uh, that famous report that um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation released two years ago that talks about how much more plastic there will be in the ocean by 2050, it actually has to be looked into 
uh, in the context of the dropping commodities prices of oil. Plastic is and will probably likely in the nearest future continue to be extremely cheap. Um, and cheap from a purely financial standpoint. We don't talk about the cost of uh, the cost it passes on society because all of these um, external costs of managing the uh, outcomes of plastic pollution are externalized and not part of the cost that manufacturers look at right now. But the cost of oil is dropping substantially. Um, it is a is a commodity. The innovation in um, of in um, you know shale oil exploration in the last few years points to a trend that is here to stay, and um, the exponential use and consumption of single use and disposable plastic and in general plastic combined with the dropping price of the raw material is very concerning, because it makes the argument of replacing this with another material very difficult. The other important trend, and it's somewhat synchronistic to the dropping um, um, material prices, has to do with the global population explosion. And uh, as you probably know, the UN projects that uh, we're going to add about 2 billion people to the global population of the Earth in the next uh, you know, 20 to 30 years. Um, the uh, the massive uh, growth of population is going to happen in areas that are coastal. And as you know, uh, the majority of population of the Earth already exists in coastal areas that are about 100 kilometers or less near a major body of water. So that also means that the massive explosion of consumption is going to happen in these areas. And this is a great concern because as you look into the density and the population and you imagine how much more consumption will grow, the, the mass amount of growth of consumption will be in the single use and disposable plastics. So that exacerbates uh, the, um, the trend and is something that we're deeply concerned about. And uh, as these two trends continue to influence each other, of course, the negative externalities of consumption will continue to grow. So the more we use, the more we will discard. And no matter how much we invest in plastic recycling, the trend of consumption will continue to grow at a much faster rate. So we do believe that investments in end of, end of pipeline strategies will be essential and urgently needed. But simultaneously with this, we're looking into uh, the decreasing the amount of material that will go towards the end of the pipeline. And uh, prevention and techniques to actually uh, change the nature of this uh, uh, waste stream from a material that essentially is eternal and very difficult to deal with into a material or a stream, waste stream of biobenign materials uh, is, is very important. So um, there is a trend that is also important and needs to be taken into consideration, which is the move towards a more circular use of packaging materials from our current linear use. And um, the, at the forefront of this thinking has been the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, with the circular economy model that incorporates the use of um, new packaging design and uh, uh, end of pipeline innovations that are intended to increase the circular use of materials. Um, what, what we like to think about is um, the change from the business as usual model, which is on the chart in front of you, which demonstrates how much of plastic is being wasted and discarded into um, material, into a model where um, there would be reuse of the packaging materials and not necessarily plastic. And let me explain this a little bit because I often find out that this chart is misunderstood. Um, when we talk about um, increasing the reuse of materials. We want to be very careful about which materials are reused over and over again. The circular use of materials that um, by nature leach toxic chemicals into the environment is not something that um, we look forward to or advocate. So what we're looking into is um, packaging that reduces the amount of plastic that it needs and increases the circular use in a way that minimizes the toxic leaching into the environment. Um, we all know that plastic is a material 
unlike any other that um, if you use it in a circular fashion, you would still need to add virgin stock to it. And there is still an output that is uh, toxic and concerning because of all the additives that are used to make uh, plastic packaging. So when we use the circular economy model in our thinking, um, the most important thing for us is that number three, which is on the bottom left-hand side, which is decouple plastics from fossil feedstocks. And um, to us, the new plastics economy uh, stresses the term new plastics economy. In other words, material that is like plastic and has all the economic properties of plastic and, and performance characteristics of plastic, but is not derived from fossil fuel stock. And uh, that is actually an area that gives us great optimism and excitement because we do believe that um, if we raise the uh, challenge to the innovation and entrepreneurial uh, world and uh, state what the requirements are for this material and what it must be but what it should not be, we have the opportunity of arriving at applications and different materials that fulfill the role of uh, conventional plastics but are not derived from fossil fuel feedstocks. And um, as you know, there, um, or as maybe you don't know, but we've discovered over the last years of working in this space, there is no silver bullet. Anytime you come up with a material that is used on a massive scale as plastic is today for fast moving consumer goods, for packaging, for food, um, on that scale, you're going to end up with unintended consequences and consequences on the scale of we cannot even anticipate today. So we're certainly not talking about replacing uh, fossil fuel plastics with anything uh, on that scale um, or immediately replacing it with seaweed or rice or, you know, uh, biofeed stock. What we're talking about here is a massive systemic innovation in, in, along the entire pipeline uh, from uh, identifying biobenign feedstocks for certain types of um, applications to manufacturing innovations that are specifically designed to use these new materials to uh, a product design and packaging innovations that that use these new materials so i'll give you an example so it doesn't sound so esoteric um, there is um, a company called echo x pack right now who is working with uh, carlson beer uh, to uh, manufacture an alternative to the bottle which is um, made of uh, fiber and uh, is able to contain drinks that um, are carbonated what that meant is you, when you start with pulp like this and add a little bit of bentonite to it to actually improve its uh, qualities and get them closer to the performance of uh, plastic, you need different manufacturing facilities. Manufacturing paper pulp um, bottles on the same facility as you manufacture plastic causes design challenges. And um, a company that we worked with and continue to work with called uh, Ecologic Design experienced those early on. They looked to make um, a bottle uh, from cardboard, but manufacture it on the current um, um, facilities that are used to manufacture plastic and ended up with two seams on both sides. The seams had to be glued. And um, the problem that that caused is um, it, it creates a pressure point so when you drop the bottle that's where it pops open so um uh, echo expect actually had a manufacturing innovation that allows them to use their material and produce bottles without that seam um, the the formula for success there is an innovative company with an innovation in material um, innovation in manufacturing that that helps use that material for a particular purpose and a secured market um, in in uh, Carls Carlsberg Beer, who is actually guaranteeing them the market for one of their niche applications in what they're uh, if they're able to deliver to their price performance characteristics. Uh, the same is happening with L'Oreal. Um, we just um, uh, supported them at a launch of a new. Uh, L'Oreal sustainable brand called uh, Seed Phytonutrients. Seed Phytonutrients is going to be packaged entirely in cardboard uh, produced by Ecologic Design, one of the companies we've worked with. And um, 
while these bottle leaves still a lot to be desired in terms of um you know still using a um, pop that is plastic um it is actually a step in the right direction and something that we will support going forward and help diversify uh, the use of feedstock for the pump and the liner with biobenign materials and degradable materials so as you see what we're talking about here is an innovation uh, effort that goes well beyond just identifying the the material we are working now with companies that use seaweed for uh, source material companies that use rice for source material on the one hand and our goal has been and one of the lessons that we've learned in the five years of running this innovation challenge that just identifying these companies with new products is not enough what what is really necessary is to build an entire innovation infrastructure to help them succeed and the infrastructure is um, uh, comprised of of course the innovation in material and manufacturing innovation but more than that it gives them the innovators and the entrepreneurs access to facilities where they can test um, for uh, toxicity for compostability for biodegradability to verify whatever claims they they are making with their material um, a lab space where they can test a mass scale production of their their product if that is ultimately the goal of what they're developing and on the other end access to an understanding of what industry needs and i cannot stress this enough we are working with um, a whole group of brands and consumer brands and businesses who have particular needs and these needs have to do with the performance of that plastic packaging what it needs to be some of them need uh, marketing features like transparency some of them need uh, performance features like moisture resistance and barriers especially in the case with multi-layer packaging so understanding what these businesses need and guiding the entrepreneurial effort in that direction is that um, that uh, spot that we occupy with the innovation accelerator and with our innovation center actually it's not just an accelerator but a center that uh, provides that 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 um, guidance and opportunity to design to requirements and not design something in a vacuum that just sits there it's a very tough um space i have to say because if it was easy somebody would have done it um, the innovation space uh, that we occupy and our entrepreneurs occupy is um, basically fraught with challenges i mean what we're looking really here is uh, several really conflicting requirements on the one hand we're talking about um, materials that come from bio benign sources which to us largely means renewable sometimes plant matter matter but they must not be food grade because we don't want to create the circumstance where this affects negatively the global uh, food prices and makes it such that this um, agricultural produce is not available for people to eat as has been the case with uh, with corn and with um, rice in many cases um, sometimes that um, that uh, material that the the requirements for material is that it is moisture resistant but also biodegradable uh, we want it to be gas impermeable and have long shelf life and synthetic chemical free free uh, so as you see these are difficult, often conflicting requirements. And as I mentioned earlier, we do not believe we'll ever find a silver bullet, a material that can fulfill all of these applications. But what we do believe is that we will find in collaboration with um, the entrepreneurs, the investors in the middle and industry, materials that fulfill uh, these needs depending on application. Not all uh, products, packaging products out there need to have all of these uh, characteristics. And um, business uh, at the end of the spectrum is able to tell us what is important to them for what applications. Um, in the five years we've been doing this, we've accelerated uh, 32 businesses. Um, the numbers on the equity financing and non-dilutive financing are already changing. Equity financing has doubled with an investment that uh, one of our uh, companies uh, had um, about uh, a month ago or so. 
And I think it's important to point out that we do not take equity. We have deliberately formed uh, Think Beyond Plastic as a, a nonprofit uh, institution so that we can largely focus on our mission to advance innovation and entrepreneurship in this space, but not to invest in any one of these companies. We do, however, make them investment ready and connect them with investors. Um, some of the larger investors in that space are family foundations, a number of them. Um, an emerging investor is the Closed Loop Fund, and um, they have diversified beyond just recycling infrastructure to um, putting in um, uh, non-equity investing and uh, uh, creating a foundation that can give grants, as well as a relatively new fund called Safer Made that invests in um, materials, uh, in chemical free materials and, and packaging among, amidst other things. So this is kind of a subset of uh, some of the companies that uh, we have um, worked with and uh, some of the products that we have helped advance. These all came to us through initially the competition. And the innovation challenge or the competition is um, basically our filter to get a lot of interesting possible innovations with commercial potential. Um, uh, you probably have heard about uh, the Cora Ball in the upper right hand corner, which is a project of the Rosalia project uh, to uh, catch microfibers in your laundry so it doesn't get into the water. Um, the one you may not have heard of, but we're also very excited about, is the upper left-hand corner, and it's a medical stapler. For those of you who don't know, um, most of the medical devices right now are made of single-use plastic and essentially are incinerated after one use. So this stapler is made of paper and has been tested in hospitals uh, with great results and it's one of the companies we're very very proud of um, in the medical space and we hope that they will have other uses uh, here you see the fiber bottle the um, to the right of the fiber bottle which is in the middle is agricultural sheeting and this is something that we deeply care about because it's a problem worldwide uh, these sheets are actually uh, considered toxic waste and at the end of the um, a harvest they're uh, collected by people with gloves and face masks and put in landfill so uh, we uh, have two companies in the accelerator that came to us through the innovation challenge whom we have helped develop and and expand and um, they have found uh, um, source material that can be bio benign biodegradable and can be composted and mulched at the end of the season and a number of other products that you see here the lollyware cup um, you know to the left of it is a 3d printing filament that's produced of plastic that the recyclers do not want and will not buy because it's uh, too cheap but um, communities nonetheless still use so these are just some of the products. Um, there is uh, many more in the portfolio and uh, we're excited to be putting together the class of the cohort for next year, which, which will have a whole number of um, these uh, product and uh, uh, technologies. Uh, just a brief list here on the slide of um, events that we have put together to highlight the innovations. Um, in the middle is, um, the head of the Rosalia project showcasing the Cora Ball at uh, our Oceans Conference last year in um, Washington, D.C. And uh, to the right is uh, events in um, New York and in Rotterdam with the innovation um, uh, cohorts for that year. So this is um, kind of a quick summary of what we do and how, why we created the accelerator and how we use the innovations that come through us through the innovation challenge. And I'll turn over to Anne right now to tell you a little bit more about the, the innovation challenge running right now. Thank you, Daniela. So as Daniela said, with the um, huge increase in global plastics production and global population comes a comparable increase in plastic waste produced, and much of that ends up in the ocean. Current estimates put over 150 million tons of plastic waste in the ocean, and we believe that abatement efforts must be coupled with longer term systemic solutions. 
In order to accelerate the search for these solutions, the United Nations Environmental Program and us, Think Beyond Plastic, have launched the 2017 Marine Plastics Innovation Challenge to engage university students and faculties around the world in the solutions-oriented effort to help solve the global marine litter problem. Many innovation and improvement efforts to date show potential, but they have proven to be too fragmented and uncoordinated to have an impact at scale. So despite these drawbacks, an opportunity beckons, and that is to move the plastics industry into a positive spiral of value, capital, value capture, stronger economics, and better environmental outcomes. So in partnership with UN Environment, we have divided this year's competition into four distinct tracks that encompass the range of challenges in developing a holistic approach that will prove effective at scale and in varied geographies. So these four tracks include design and engineering, communications, prediction and recovery, and economics. And I'll now talk a bit about the specifics of each track and what we are looking for in a successful application. Design and engineering. We are looking for engineering solutions and accompanying business plans that prevent plastic pollution from entering the marine environment through innovations in material, technology, or product design and redesign. So this spans a range of opportunities from early stage innovations to near market solutions that have the potential to be funded and manufactured to scale. Examples of materials innovation include bio benign materials from sustainable sources that do not compete with the human food chain, as talked about by Daniela earlier. And examples of product design include improved washing machine filters to reduce the influx of microplastics from clothing, packaging design to minimize unnecessary single-use plastic waste or exposure of products to plastic, and industrial design that, for example, minimizes plastic intensity in products. Communications. We are looking for the most creative and innovative communications product to support the goals of UN Environment's global clean seas campaign on marine litter, communicating the economic, environmental, human health, and aesthetic problems posed by marine litter is challenging, and creating awareness of the problem is a very important step in working towards solutions. We encourage creativity and applications to this track. Entries might be mobile apps, creative communication strategies, music, short film, media, storytelling, or any other products that demonstrate the capacity to reach and engage large groups of people. An entry should both reach large numbers of people and also engage individuals and sectors to take action. These actions must aim for measurable reduction of the problem. Examples might include how to inc increase awareness and engage civil society, the private sector, and governments through innovative campaigns, products, apps, radio spots, song lyrics, art, or another form of outreach product. Whenever possible, two-way communication will be a part of a successful application. Prediction and recovery. We are looking for the most innovation prediction and or risk-based recovery tool or methodology to identify and model marine litter hotspots. These may include areas of high marine litter accumulation, biodiversity hotspots, important fishing grounds and fish nurseries, or particularly, particularly sensitive and fragile areas of the marine ecosystem. Modeling and predicting the transport and accumulation of marine litter and how it impacts certain areas may be developed with already existing shipping routes, marine wildlife migration routes, or biodiversity hotspots in order to better prioritize recovery efforts and policy and decision making surrounding the issue. These efforts may span a range of geographical coverage, including the subnational, national, and regional scales. Entries in this track may also include improving and or testing the use of remote sensing technologies. Economics. 
The full impact of marine plastic on economics is unknown, but we do know that it is substantial and affects several sectors of the economy. The impact on maritime nat natural capital is significant, and initial studies suggest that it is at least in the billions of dollars. One estimate puts the annual damage of plastics to marine ecosystems at 13 billion US dollars per year, and the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation estimates that the cost of ocean plastics to the tourism, fishing, and shipping industries is $1.3 billion in that region alone. In addition to the direct economic costs, there are potential adverse impacts on human livelihoods and health, food chains, and other essential economic and societal systems. So in, in this track, we are looking for the most innovative, accurate, and complete valuation method or model for marine litter effects and a robust upscalable model to value both the direct or tan tangible and direct or intangible economic effects. Economic valuations of alternative materials, approaches, and investments in end of life or upstream solutions are also of interest. The challenge also encompasses innovative ways of financing preventative interventions. These could include self-sustaining methods through reuse, recycling, and the like. So the competition is open only to university students 18 years old or older who are enrolled in an undergraduate or graduate program as of June of this year, 2017. An applicant can enter one track or multiple tracks and can enter either as an individual or part of a team. Each applicant must have the support of a faculty member at his or her university. Entries are currently being accepted on an ongoing basis, and we have just decided to extend the deadline for accepting applications in this first round through November 20th of this year. Applicants who have already started or completed their entry can continue to update and modify it through November 20th. Judging will then take place from November 20th through December 13th. The top entries will be invited to submit additional information about their innovations during the second round or finals, which runs from December 18th through February 2nd of next year. Judging of the finals occurs from February 5th through February 28th, and the four winners, one from each track, will be announced at the 6th International Marine Debris Conference in San Diego, California, next March 12th through 16th. Winners will be both given the opportunity to present their ideas at the conference and will also be invited to participate in the 2018 Think Beyond Plastic Innovation Accelerator. We are honored to have an impressive lineup of individuals as jurors for the competition. A blend of scientists, artists, consumer advocates, and business people are represented on the jury. Each juror will review applications within one track that aligns most closely with his or her expertise. Some of the jurors are local to the Monterey Bay area, such as faculty Jason Scorsese and Patrick Cotter from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies and Mark Shelley of the C Studios Foundation. Others, including Frederick Petit, an expert in sustainability as a driver of business, business growth, and Yula Kutsubu, an artist who has collaborated with us in Honduras as part of our Mesoamerican Reef Project, have international backgrounds. Each juror offers a unique combination of experience, depth of knowledge, and perspective, and will contribute great value to the application review process and eventually selection of the four winners. As the jurors assigned to each track review applications, they will, they will be selecting those that best meet the following criteria to proceed onto the finals. They will be considering the strength of the innovation, is the idea truly unique? How exciting is it? How does it compare with other existing efforts in the space? Is it collaborative? Are there unintended consequences? They will also be considering its impact on marine plastics and looking at questions such as, what is the impact on marine plastics? How is it measured? 
How is it demonstrated? Over what period of time? Can it be replicated and can they demonstrate impact? They'll also be considering the scale and feasibility. Who is the target audience? What is the plan to launch the innovation? How have they validated their assumptions? Also, the capacity to, capacity to execute will be considered. Do they have freedom to operate? What are the team's core competencies? How will they find talent to complete their gaps? And how will they fund their idea? And finally, completeness. Is the innovation articulated in simple, easy to understand terms? Is it complete? How well is the idea poised to truly make a difference? So that we ask that you please share this exciting opportunity with your contacts and within networks to which you belong. The competition has a large ongoing social media presence. So please like us on Facebook at Think Beyond Plastic Innovation Accelerator and follow us on Twitter at TBP Innovate. We invite you to think beyond Plastic 17 with us and toward Clean Seas. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Ann Warner and Daniela Russo. Again, this is John Davis, MarineDebris.info supervisor. Uh, that was a great presentation and super exciting work that, that Think Beyond Plastic uh, and its partners are doing. Uh, and uh, it's been it's been great to to learn a ton about uh, what you're up to and and what you've learned over over the last five years. So we now open up the webinar to audience Q and A for the next about 20 minutes. If audience members have a question for our presenters, you can submit it in the question box that's on the control panel on screen. And some of you have already started doing that. We will be drawing from those questions throughout this question and answer session. Uh, so Daniela and Anne, uh, we had a couple questions very early on that came in um, on very specific, uh, they were very specific to individual questions on the application form for the innovation challenge. For example, one asked what you mean by the term layers of complexity in question seven, and I'm not sure which application track the question asker is referring to. Um, so if that particular question is something you can address easily and quickly, we can do it here. Otherwise, if there are similar questions on individual um, aspects of the application form that might be better addressed, perhaps outside of the webinar, um, we can set that up as well. So let me know. Well, um, so uh, let me just say this. Uh, we cannot answer specific questions about the application, que uh, uh, specifics about the application questions, because that would not be fair to the rest of the uh, entrants. So um, we can answer only questions that are already answered on the website. Uh, and I'm sure you will understand the nature of every competition is it needs to give a fair, um, uh, you know, competing uh, grounds to everyone. So just clarifying for one person and not for others is not um, not something we can do. Um, I think that uh, uh, Anne can answer questions on email if people can send them. And there is a certain limit to what we can and cannot do. So I'd rather uh, not address those right now, if you don't mind. Okay, that's fair enough. Thanks, Daniela. Uh, question, in your experience, how receptive has industry been to new non-fossil plastic innovations? Well, um, so industry is a large, um, large uh, term. And uh, I will say this, there is, um, there are companies who are definitely seeing the shift towards um, renewable and bio-benign materials as a consumer um, design, as something that the public wants, as something that consumers want. Many of these companies are members of the new plastics economy effort that is championed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And they're actively experimenting with uh, redesigning their packaging such that it conforms to these requirements. In our experience, companies don't really care that much about plastic or something else as long as it fulfills their needs, which is presentation, shelf life, um, 
ability to deliver the value to their consumers that they do right now, which is also, you know, cleanliness, uh, hygiene, and things like that. So if we're able to identify another material that meets some of these characteristics or most, um, if not all, then they will be open to this. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, um, it's something that it's a it's a process that truly we're in the beginning of. Um, I think that there are a lot of opportunities to diversify away from fossil fuel based plastics if we're successful in finding the right alternatives. And privately, and you know, something that they don't publish necessarily or share with the public, they're looking also on their own for these materials. So. Um, some of them are hopefully many more of them will follow suit and in this i think we will love to support the efforts of consumer advocacy organizations and consumers demanding these alternatives be made available and do you have anything to add to that i think daniela can speak better to that than i <laughs> okay excellent um along that them. line uh, one one audience member noted that um, that she had recently seen non-plastic uh, bags made of tamarind seeds in Mexico and yucca in uh, Malaysia. Um, so that's uh, that's good. To we're hear we're about. we're very very interested in the yucca bags. Please contact us. Um, it's uh, a Warner at thinkbeyondplastic.com or d Russo at thinkbeyondplastic.com. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what action would you like to see from government officials or agencies in support of your efforts? Um, well, I'll answer and um, and then I promise I will let Anne speak more. But um, I, can, I can tell you uh, an effort that we're pushing right now, and this is why we're going to our Oceans Conference in Malta next week. We believe that for an effort, entrepreneurial effort on the magnitude that uh, we're driving and leading, for it to be successful, it needs government participation and support in terms of um, uh, incentives for these entrepreneurs on the one hand. These entrepreneurs need um, low interest loans for what they do. They need grants, they need funding and support for that kind of innovation. And if that type of innovation with focus on marine plastics and plastic pollution is a well understood necessity and a well understood problem, then governments need to participate in supporting that kind of innovation with, with grants, with uh, financial resources, uh, whatever is necessary. On the other end, um, incorporating innovation is tough. So a lot of the businesses that we talk to, major consumer brands, have made substantial investments in the current manufacturing processes. So uh, they are going to incur uh, significant costs in um, designing away from these systems and these manufacturing capacities. So we would like also to see government uh, help offset some of these um, some of these losses or some of these investments they would make, and encouraging that type of innovation. Um, you know, government has a, international governments have tremendous power to do this again through uh, tax incentives and uh, uh, mandating certain materials to be more mainstream than they are right now, and um, that is true for governments all over the world. Uh, bans and um, uh, these other tools for kind of strategically and surgically eliminate certain products also create entrepreneurial opportunities. And um, uh, for that purpose, you know, supporting for uh, bans on plastic bags and straws is just something that global governments uh, are lining behind and uh, we expect that to continue and we will support it. And um, just to add a little bit to that, as we found in our work on the Mesoamerican Reef, where the local governments and municipalities play a strong role in, you know, being able to implement bans or change consumer behavior, we found that it's very important not only to ban an item, but to provide the general public and consumers with an alternative to use. 
for example, um, on one island in Honduras, there was a plastic bag ban, but then people were like, okay, we don't have plastic bags, but we need a bag, what do we use now? Um, so an integral part of making that work was providing families with reusable bags so that they had an alternative to take with them when they went to the local grocery store. That's great, thanks both of you. Uh, we have a couple questions uh, with regard to the student aspect of the of the challenge. One, I imagine you get quite a bit. Why is the innovation challenge open only to students and faculty? Because uh, I'm thinking, what if a non-student has a great idea that you will thus never know about? The question asker um, says. And then the other question is: uh, Are recent graduates eligible for the challenge? Uh, this this uh, asker was enrolled in uh, as recently as June 2017 and just graduated um, and uh, with a master's and would like to be involved. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. So. yeah. I think that the person who was enrolled in June is still eligible to enter the competition yeah. um, because the competition rules just require enrolled as of June 2017, there isn't a specific requirement that the enrollment be ongoing. Um, so I think if that individual wants to enter the competition and can get the um, backing or support of a faculty member at the institution that he or she went to, I think it would be fine for them to enter the competition. Um, and Daniela can perhaps speak as to why only open to students, but I will say that for those who have great innovative ideas and are not students are more than welcome to apply to the Think Beyond Plastic Innovation Accelerator. Um, and that is open to anyone. And you can send a note directly. There is a process on the website. But why only students um, is actually a good question, and, and I will tell you, um, we found out, uh, we, we've been running this innovation challenge annually, and what we found out is that our focus has been on um, a commercially viable businesses in, in any stage, you know, early stage or um, pre-funding or post-funding, but that sort of eliminated very early innovation from students and student groups uh, and the other piece that we've never included in the competition has been the economics track or the communications track and in talking with uh, the partners uh, the uh, global partnership for marine litter at uh, the un environment we thought wouldn't it be great if we capture this great entrepreneurial and innovative spirit with the earlier stage thinkers the the students and to do this, we kind of diversified the competition a bit, but also released uh, some of our very stringent standards for uh, commercial, uh, commercial, commercial potential. And this way, it's a little easier to get in, but also stimulates broader-based innovative spirit, which is ultimately our goal. So this is why we uh, we specifically made it a little easier for students to to compete, and uh, we wanted to reach a broader audience. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we had a couple qu uh, technical questions. One person asking for your emails again, um, and if there's some way that we can bring them up on screen, perhaps um, share them in writing uh, with the audience, that that'd be great. And we'll we'll try to figure that out. Um, and then asking uh, when the new deadline um, for applications will be up on your website. Um, do you have, will that be later today oh, or? We, yes, yes. We are going to be updating the website and the portals uh, sort of by the end of uh, this week. So uh, any day now. And the um, email addresses are very easy. It's drusso or a warner at thinkbeyondplastic.com. And if you want to write it down, I don't know if you're still looking at our last slide, John, but it says there an email address. It has an email address there, info at thinkbeyondplastic.com. That's a general one that goes to our entire team. Perfect. That's great. And Nick Wayner, just to put in the chat section, going out to everybody in the, um, in the webinar, the, the email address for Ann Warner. Perfect. Um, 
we have uh, we have a comment from someone outside the U.S. Uh, I see your group is U.S. based. Are there any similar innovation accelerators in Europe or Asia or other world manufacturing centers? We actually work globally, and um, uh, the fact that we are physically located in the U.S. is irrelevant. Um, where the teams that we put together and the cohorts that we put together have global representation. Last year, the cohort included groups from the Netherlands, from the UK, a group from Guatemala, um, and uh, kind of the extended cohort included some entrepreneurs from Uganda and India Canada. and Canada. So, uh, you know, the days of the brick and mortar businesses are gone. We have an office um, in uh, California, but like I said, this is just ground zero. We operate around the world. Um, in the cohort for this year, we already have um, entrants from uh, for, for next year, for 2018, from Indonesia, from Kenya. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a truly global effort. And uh, we solicit innovation through partnerships in Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, Europe. That's great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions here on new the concept of new plastics, um, new new sources of plastic. And one person says, "I'm a bit confused by your definition of plastic, especially when you talk about non-fossil fuel source plastic. Are you talking about a different material altogether, or plastic based on carbon from non-fossil fuel sources?" And then another question is, "How do you think we can make such new plastics economically competitive with fossil fuel-based plastics if the retailers who sell the packaging?" don't feel the cost of the subsequent environmental pollution. Well, that's the entire purpose of our accelerator, to identify um, applications where non-fossil fuel packaging alternatives can be used in lieu of conventional fossil fuel plastics that are so cheap. Uh, what are these applications? Uh, at what point do they become uh, commercially viable and um, economically uh, viable for uh, packaging manufacturers or for the consumer brands that use them. So that is the challenge. You put your finger on, on the issue. And as I mentioned earlier throughout my talk, we're not going to find one material that will replace uniformly everything. What we're likely to find out is an entire packaging redesign, um, different applications that are suited to different contents and um, diversify away from just kind of the use of conventional fossil fuel based plastic across the board into new um, new types of packaging, new models, new manufacturing, and all of this cumulatively will reduce the reliance on the fossil fuel based plastic that is full and 100 percent today. Um, the um, the new plastics economy is an initiative that is started by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and uh, it includes many different directions, including new materials, but also redesigning conventional use of plastics into these kind of new applications. We like to um, use the term new plastics to identify alternatives to conventional plastics uh, that are biobenign, that are not fossil fuel based. So uh, that is the purpose of our search in the material space. We're looking into biofilm, we're looking into uh, different kinds of uh, sources like seaweed, algae, um, um, cellulose rich agricultural waste, uh, like corn husks, cannabis, agricultural waste, of which there is plenty around the world. Great, thank you. In what ways can other NGOs like Surfrider or Nature Conservancy or, or any other NGOs that are inspired by the, the uh, very thoughtful, creative, thorough work that Think Beyond Plastic and, and the Challenge and Accelerator are doing, what's the best way today that they can get involved and spread and promote the ideas that are emerging from your work? So there, there, is a, there are two very important ways in which we partner and collaborate with other NGOs. I will let Anne speak to uh, these aspects with regards to the competition. But with regards to the work of Think Beyond Plastic, the, the work of these NGOs is 
absolutely essential in creating the demand and the interest in these new products. Absolutely, I cannot stress this enough, absolutely essential. Um, big brands, consumer uh, facing businesses will not be moved to make a difference or to make a change if there is no interest in these alternatives. And what we hear a lot and often from the brands is that consumers don't want it. So uh, Surfrider, Five Gyres, um, the uh, plastic pollution uh, NGOs around the world are absolutely essential in continuing to build this demand. And so uh, as they build the demand and they build the interest in these new alternatives, we will continue to work with the entrepreneurs to create the alternatives because policies and this big demand need to be supported by commercially viable uh, products and solutions in the marketplace. So we, we, uh, we uh, absolutely admire and respect their work and um, we truly look forward to working with all of them and we already are connected with a large group of um, ngos and will continue to do so their work is really important as it gives us it, they're the bellwether they're the the kind of the the direction of where this is all going and how we can um, participate by developing solutions and yes just to build off of that um, as was mentioned repeatedly in the presentation, um, well, Think Beyond Plastics core competency is accelerating the innovation. Um, we recognize that there are very other important um, aspects to bringing about real sustainable change. And that's where we rely upon um, partnerships with our other organizations, whether it's education and outreach, um, promoting changes in consumer behavior, um, or other aspects. Um, we can't and don't do it all, um, but we recognize that it's a very much a combined effort. And specifically with respect to the competition, we just ask that anyone and everyone um, promote it as widely as possible. We're really excited to get as many um, and as varied entrance entries as possible. That's great, thank you. Uh, we have, uh, we're just about out of time. Um, time for maybe one more question. Uh, you've been doing this innovation challenge for five years now, and I imagine you've learned a lot over that time. When you look back, are there, briefly, is, is there one thing or a couple things that you wish you'd known back then that you've had to learn as you went along? What we've learned and loud and clear is that innovation alone is not enough truly we started this innovation challenge five years ago thinking we'll figure out who the winner is and the best and brightest idea will revol revolutionize the world we'll give them money and support and awareness and they'll go and make a difference and what we found out was very humbling this is not enough what is really needed is creating the uh, infrastructure for success, the, the fertile soil on which uh, thousands of these innovations will grow. As um, my background is in business and what I know about the investors is they don't like to put money in one innovation no matter how good it is. They like to see a fertile soil, a thriving innovation space of which they would have a choice of several. And um, we focused our efforts precisely because of this on creating this innovation ecosystem and this fertile spa space of innovation. Our dream is five years from now that we will have a space where innovation with focus on plastic pollution will thrive. And there would be in that slide that I showed you with the 35 businesses, that would be 3,500 businesses doing this, some better than others, but all different from each other. That is our dream and that's our goal. And that is what we are looking forward to build. Perfect, thank you. Um, with that, we, we conclude this webinar. We've received a lot of questions. Thank you, everybody in the audience. Uh, I'm sorry that we did not uh, have time to get to all of them. But on behalf of MarineDebris.info, Open Channels, and the EBM Tools Network, 
I want to sincerely thank Ann Warner and Daniela Russo for contributing your insights. That was very interesting. I applaud your work and I look forward to having you back five years from now for uh, <laughs> another five years worth of, of, uh, of trends and lessons that you've seen. Uh, so thank you. And, uh, and thanks again to the audience for participating as well. Uh, Thank you, John, day. for giving us this opportunity. Yeah. And thanks to the audience for your interest. Thank you. You're very welcome. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.